Okay, and just to confirm, you can only see the main oh. presentation one, right? Okay. All right, well, as I go through, since we have lots of experts in the space, um, feel free to please jump in and on your thoughts. Um, but we'll try to quickly go through kind of a brief intro uh, to human rights education, training, and learning. Um, and then uh, Christy will review a little bit mm -hmm. Human Rights Educators USA. Um, these are our, just our, you know, to the question of we're doing so much, what's going on. Um, these are our upcoming sessions um, with the event registration. And I believe another communication will go out about these. But for the sake of time, we'll move along. Um, and I might also just skip the introductions since we are in, in the space and now already get the chance to do that. Um, and move right into, sorry, Sandy. No, okay. Um, so the definition, there are multiple definitions and conceptualizations of human rights and therefore human rights education. Um, and there are some though common elements to, to most definitions that are used. So the definition that Human Rights Educators USA uses is that human rights education and training is a lifelong process of teaching and learning that helps individuals, groups, and communities develop their knowledge, skills, and values to fully exercise and protect their human rights and those of others to fulfill their responsibilities in the context of internationally recognized human rights principles, <clears throat> excuse me, and to achieve justice and peace in the world. So these kind of common elements can be found in lots of different definitions. Um, one is that it both has some sort of understanding that human rights education is both content as well as process and usually a focus on participatory learning approaches. Um, there's usually a component of it's presented in different ways, either knowledge, attitude, values, and skills action, or some say the head, heart, hands. But usually human rights education includes these three components. Uh, and lastly, education or human rights education is often discussing these terms of about, through, and for. So about human rights um, and what falls into this bucket is contested and debated. Um, the UN definition says it's understanding mechanisms, human rights rules and principles, um, human rights law. Um, education through is kind of the practice what you preach piece of human rights education, this idea that the education to take place in an environment that is respecting the rights of educators and learners. Um, and this expands, uh, expands not only to the classroom, but to the broader learning environment. Um, for example, in formal education, it would mean ensuring that school policies are also rights-based and that other individuals who are employed by the school, um, their rights are respected, for example, labor rights of, of those in school environments. And then finally, there's this concept of for human rights, which is empowering individuals to take action for, to respect others' rights and to defend their rights. So there's, on the scholarship side, um, there's different kind of categories. Um, I'm borrowing most of these from um, Kayyum Ahmed, um, but he refers to one group as kind of classification scholarship. So this is identifying different categories or models of human rights education. Lisa Tibbetts, um, has one where she talks about either a values and awareness approach, an accountability approach, or an activism transformation approach. Um, and if there's time, I'm happy to go into more detail about which of those are and what they mean. Um, and then Monisha Bajaj has three categories where she refers to global citizenship, um, human rights education for coexistence, which is more in peace building context, and then human rights education for transformative action. Um, and there's some overlap between these models, particularly with the transformation one, this idea that human rights is rooted in the lived experiences of the learner and the idea that they are empowered to take action for human rights within their own communities. The other group is this uh, notion of diffusion scholarship. So a lot have done research on just the extent to which human rights is incorporated into curriculum or incorporated into formal textbooks. Uh, critical human rights education scholarship. Um, I've included two, there are many others, um, which is recognizing the transformative potential of human rights education, but also recognizing that sometimes um, it's vulnerable to appropriation and misuse. Um, for example, uh, Garnet Russell just has a book out last year talking about how the government in Rwanda supported human rights education, but did so in a way that was kind of co-opting human rights to entrench their state power. 
So this scholarship kind of recognizes that uh, human rights education doesn't always in practice um, lead to greater respect for human rights or the adoption of rights-based approaches. And then Kayum kind of building on this idea comes up with this idea of human rights as sovereignty or disruption. So again, human rights can be co-opted to further entrench state sovereignty or can be used as the means of challenging state power and being transformative and revolutionary. Um, and so with this, um, I feel like these are just some understandings or conceptualizations of what is human rights education. Um, so I know we're a small group, but I just wanted to open up to see if anybody wanted to share a, a different understanding of human rights education and training. Uh, the only thing I'd like to throw out is that what we've been learning and what we've just even Rosemary and I just wrote about is the connection of human rights education to social emotional learning, which is really so well, you know, it's it's been seen as such a vital uh, element of a, a positive education for young people, you know, for all ages. And what we talked about in our our chapter is the fact that human rights education gives some context to what, why it's important to respect other people, why it's important to be aware of yourself and your impact on others. So I, I like the idea of, of connecting um, human rights education with the whole person and, and that it really does offer a framework of understanding why even learning these ideas of social emotional learning are so vital and also why knowing about human rights is vital uh, for that positive development. Thank you. That, I think that helps, helps me also, Sandy, because I, I do think of its application also with, um, and, and I think it's inferred in a lot of these different frameworks, but um, with experiential forms of education, like like service learning, you know, um, that, and I remember, I think it was, um, oh, and her name is slipping my mind, Nicole Pal Palaz from Wisconsin, who said, you know, it sort of objectifies what can be a process that is oftentimes, um, you know, it, it feels sort of loaded sort of like values-based education or something. Service learning, I think, has always struggled with that relationship to um, sort of character development and that kind of thing. So I love that human rights-based approaches to action and experiential education objectify it, I think, in a, in a nice way. Well, and I think, um, Maddie, what we've been working on or just completed a, um, a chapter on looks at kind of the really questioning participation, you know, how a actively have we been able to have young people um, involved in decision-making or training even of, you know, putting human rights education into practice. And so I think um, that a, a lot of this work that we see is, um, it's a work in progress because we, um, may say, you know, okay, we want to create this field that's participatory and inclusive and non-discriminatory and, um, you know, based on equity and equality, but we're all learning constantly. And so I think my work um, has been looking at both the personal transformation or how we're, we're learning in this process of doing human rights education and training work both kind of as a self, but then collectively, you know, what is that collective context? And similarly, which I think oftentimes we, we think about the environment or climate as, as maybe something else, because then you're talking about human rights and the humanness. And so I'm trying to really um, look at land um, as maybe a part of that um, land water um, air a part of the bridge and some of the work that we have not done effectively enough uh, and yet has been a part of us because mm -hmm. um, land and our our positional contexts you know do inform who we are and and we're constantly um, either moving to or from land and so I, I, I think there's a, a rich 
uh, what I'd say for human rights education is it it's ever evolving. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, this field allows us to to try and be critical or, or critically inquiring about, well, what isn't working? And, you know, what have we, you know, said is potentially doctrine or that that fear. And I think that's where the critical scholars are like, wait, are we just trying to say that the Universal Declaration is the perfect document without any even critique about, well, what isn't that, you know, what, when did that come out and how, you know, should it be growing in some way, shape or form or, or adapted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, I like that critical approach, especially because it does create space. It acknowledges there's something to be learned and something valuable in the UDHR and in these documents, but also create space to allow the learner to challenge those frameworks and to explore what they mean in their own lives and in their own contexts and kind of that discursive approach to, to understanding human rights and human rights education. I likewise find valuable because I agree with you, Christy, just as the human rights field is evolving and needs to be critiqued and challenged and is growing, I think human rights education likewise needs to, to be doing the same thing. And my last little it's hard to put this point. into one or two slides. It killed me. Yeah. No, I think you've done a really good job. And I do think that one exciting part for this arena is oftentimes when we talk about human rights or uh, the folks that have been speaking up and are really acknowledged are the, at least um, from my experience, are, are the lawyers or the politicians, you know, the political lens of this work. And so I do think that we have a rich um, space to offer, you know, what is the methodologies, what are the methodologies rather that we're using and how has training or collectively learning together or self, you know, mm -hmm. um, what can we add to the field as a part of the narrative of how human rights education has evolved and the potential for its future? Indeed, thank you. All right, for the sake of time, I'm going to run through some of these. Um, in some ways, I feel like the, the why is it important is evidenced and contained in some of the definitions in the sense that it's transformative, um, has transformative power to help ensure respect for human rights um, and greater ability to defend and promote human rights. Um, speaking of lawyers, though, if one wants to make a legal argument, um, the right to human rights education is also recognized not only in the UN Declaration for Human Rights Education and Training, but as mentioned in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as many other international covenants. It's also um, one of the SDGs. So human rights education is, is not a thing on the margins or a fringe element. It's considered central to the realization and promotion of human rights, even within the international human rights legal framework. So briefly to review, um, I think it's important to talk about human rights principles, especially when we're talking about the education through human rights, because it's the human rights values and principles that inform that work. Um, so I think you can unpack and challenge lots of these. So I'm gonna throw them out there without necessarily engaging in all the critiques of some of them, that which we very much could do if we had more time, including what does universality of human rights really mean? Um, but this idea of respect for human dignity, universality and alienability, which I'll say at least at the minimum is this idea that all human rights, all humans have rights by nature being human while recognizing that there are cultural critiques of certain aspects of the universality of human rights. Um, this notion of indivisibility and the interdependence and interrelatedness of human rights. Um, so one rights violation usually leads to others. Similarly, the promotion of human rights leads to greater realization of other rights. Um, some of the other principles or values that I think particularly play in to education through human rights are the principles of equality and non-discrimination. Um, the idea of, as you mentioned, Chrissy, participation and inclusion of rights holders in um, decision-making. So if it's on a human rights intervention or program, it would be the community members who are most affected designing collectively, participating in, in making decisions about what steps to take. Um, we could talk about what that, if we had that time, there's a discussion of what does this look like in a classroom, but what does participatory inclusive approaches look like in a classroom? Transparency regarding how decisions are made, um, empowerment and agency of the rights holders, um, accountability, um, 
and the responsibility of individuals and organizations, um, not only their rights, but there's also this parallel obligation or responsibility to respect human rights. Um, other core principles I've heard um, presented um, include uh, nonviolence, um, anti-racism. Um, many of those can also be embedded under the non-discrimination. Um, but I, that's all to say that I don't want to suggest that there's a finite core list of principles of human rights, but these are the ones that are put forward most often. Um, maybe again, for the sake of time and because we're a smaller group, I'll forego the conversation of what does, how do these principles play out in a classroom or in an educational environment? Um, but it's something I think important to think about. Um, some critiques of human rights education and training. We've talked about these a little bit already, but I'll briefly touch on them. Um, to say some can critique it as being a little, and of course this is all based on how you do this type of human rights education and training. You know, different folks engage in it in different ways, um, and it's not a one size fits all. But sometimes human rights education and training can be declarationist in the sense that it just presents, um, uses more of a banking approach to education, a top down like here's the content of the UDHR that you should know, and focuses knowledge only on international laws and and declaration content without creating that room for discourse and critique. Um, again, some have critiqued that it can be used to promote Western values um, or that can be co-opted and used by governments for their own interests. Um, and another critique is that it can ignore structural and institutional discrimination and violence. Um, again, it all depends on how human rights education is used. Um, this does not reflect best practices in human rights education, but again, it's important to be aware of the critiques um, that are put forward um, for human rights education. Um, so again, briefly, maybe, if, does anybody want to share any other critiques or counter, <laughs> counter arguments to the critiques of human rights education? Do we have any? Okay. Um, Christy, this um, is your slide. Well, I think that in a way it's, it's, a bit of a summary of what you've already discussed and this idea of, or questioning, um, who is a human rights educator, trainer, what does that really mean? And I think oftentimes, even in, schol in scholarly worlds, you have your activist scholar and, and activist educator or learner. So I think what I've seen so far is that, that really it is a, a constant um, lifelong learning process. Um, once you start into this journey of understanding uh, human rights and responsibilities and thinking through what does that really mean in application, it, it's, uh, yeah, I guess, a, a constant work in progress. So we've discussed the values and awareness framing of the um, kind of getting to know a little bit about the language and feeling comfortable with the language. This constant accountability cross check, both on self, you know, okay, what do I know? Or if you're taking on an initiative, so you're taking on a project because you've identified a problem, we're taking on a campaign that we'll be discussing in our first uh, training as action series. That how do you then reflect upon that? You've taken action, but what were the unintended? Um, unintended outcomes. Sometimes they might have um, negative impacts that were not forecasted. So that, that whole constant, constant kind of need to, to cross check and, and reflect. And then this notion around activism and transformation. I mean, I think oftentimes we talk about, oh, it's a transformative process. But I think what we need to do is what does that really mean? What, you know, and, and as we even think about our training as action series, you know, we're transforming from what to what, <laughs> and, and is it that clear cut that there's a change, or is it uh, more dynamic? Um, but this notion of, wait, we want to be activating and feel like we can, whether it's through voice, song, you know, um, the multiple different ways, um, be able to, um, know something new. Um, holistic and relational learning. I, I think one thing I've learned even this summer with HRE USA and doing a number of the member profiles with some of our fellows and listening in is that we 
you know, the relationship is why people continue in this work, I, I believe, and with this network of learners, because it is, we don't know it. We don't know everything. Um, and we want to continually um, challenge both ourselves and our communities to try and improve um, the situation. And, and I think when things get down and when we run into conflicts or we see the worst of humanity, I think having uh, a community that you can find hope in <laughs> um, when, when things look very challenging is really important. So I think that that kind of the pessimism, optimism, and, and how we can um, look at the, those areas and storytelling and sharing our experiences. So at least from my um, work in the field and what I've been doing as of late, I really see us as activist educators, but you can challenge that too. Maybe you're not. <laughs> um, but I, I think that these are elements to keep on the forefront as we go forward in the work. Thanks. Christine. And I now um, think we're going to transfer over to Sandy, who's yes. going to um, to kind of talk about how human rights education connects up with other movements or uh, initiatives, uh, frameworks, as well as then um, a little bit more, maybe, uh, I think, uh, Maddie, you already uh, were here last time, so we'll we might not dive deeper into human rights education, but um, Sandy can really show how she's used it as a concrete case study and, and applied this in our work. So you can actually stop sharing, I think at this point, the slides, Christina, thank you. Um, I've been involved uh, with a committee at HRA USA, it's called Innovations and Partnerships. And so, what we've been attempting to do is figure out ways that we can identify collaborations with other entities. And in part, because originally this committee was the development committee to raise funds. And, and I think that what we've learned is how vital it is to figure out collaborations with others. And, and I have a personal, like I am crazed now about the need for collaboration, especially among allies, because I think that in a, keep hearing about how divide, divided our country is and how there's so much divisive language that is going on. And so one of the things that we've taken up in the committee has been to identify ways to show the connection of human rights education with other key endeavors. And so the three, well, two are, have, we have produced documents about and one has already been produced. Um, I think Rosemary Blanchard was responsible for that, right? Uh, the education and democracy uh, for democracy, but in oh, any we case, did that yeah for Human Rights Educators USA actually put that document together. Oh, like, okay, great collaboration. So, what we've done in our committee, we we created one document that describes the connection of human rights education and social justice advocacy because um, crazily there are people that will say, well, I don't do human rights work, I do social justice work, and it's really like shocking to me that uh, there'd be this kind of lack of understanding about how closely connected these areas are. And uh, so we wrote about that and where the connection is because there is strength in, we really, uh, actually, I, um, why have I just blanked on her name, this wonderful person who was the inspiration for our definition. I just blanked on her name. That was speaking at our party, she, at our celebration of December 10th, a couple of years ago, who worked on helping people get out of the KKK. I've just blanked on her name. You know her very well. Loretta Ross? Loretta Ross. Yes, thank you. She just, her book just went out of it. But Loretta Ross, who I greatly admire, thanks to being introduced to her through HR USA, um, did a workshop that I was attending and she calls herself a human rights activist and a social justice activist. And so I asked her the question, how do you explain the connection between the two? And her words were a little crustier, but we used what she said as the basis for what we should, said. But she said, you know, human rights advocacy is when you see something that needs attention, that needs to be fixed you do something about it. And that is human rights action, uh, or that is social justice advocacy, excuse me. And human rights 
provides kind of the framework or the standards to which that effort is geared so that there really is this very direct connection between the two. And I feel very strongly human rights can, understanding human rights can actually amplify the importance of different social justice advocacy efforts. And so we've described that um, in this, in this write-up, which is on the website, which we're gonna get kind of more organized shortly so that they're kind of all together. The other that we just finished working on is the social or the human rights perspective on diversity, equity, and inclusion endeavors. And again, uh, the idea behind that is to show that the, these are, while there are uh, initiatives that are called DEI in schools, it would be helpful for the teachers involved to actually see how this is connected to human rights, that they're, they're not, it's not something that's going on on one track and not connected to a, a larger framework of human rights. So we have, we have hopefully uh, created some material that helps people read about the connection and then be a basis perhaps for more dialogue about it. Um, so, that's, that's where we are so far. Who knows what we'll come up with next. I think that wherever we see that there are these initiatives happening, it's important to see that we play a role, that social, that human rights education is part of it. We're not this separate thing going down a railroad track that uh, doesn't include all these other tracks that are happening, but in fact, we really converge and, and can get a lot of strength from our collaborative efforts. Thanks. Yeah, I think especially engaging in those conversations between the intersection of human rights and social justice or other rights-based lenses that are used, especially in the United States, where some may, um, the, whether it's strategically or because they're just not as familiar with the frameworks or not using a human rights framework. Um, but I also am curious to see, because I feel like at different moments in time, social justice has also pushed human rights in new directions. Um, like I feel like the social justice movement got to the climate rights and human rights and, and environmental issues kind of faster than the human rights community did. So I just think there's such interesting um, contributions back and forth um, between these two movements. So right. great that right. we're talking about that more directly. Right. And I, I think that, again, I think it's like seeing the people working in environmental uh, action to help the environment and say, I'm a, I'm a social justice advocate for the environment can still be able to say, and I see this as a human rights issue because right. after all we have the right to be healthy. We have the right mm -hmm. <laughs> to survive basically. So they're not, they're really not exclusive of each other. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel that being able to voice it from the combined perspective actually gives strength to the effort mm -hmm. doesn't diminish. Well, mm -hmm. And we'll have uh, our second session. I think we've mentioned uh, our next session or Christina might want to uh, share a little bit about her, her vision on the, the campaign or the activism session for the training as action. But then after that one is going to be one on indigenous people's rights and uh, human rights. And I think we'll be learning from a number of uh, human rights leaders, how they've actually haven't seen the notion of human rights separate from the environment, but mm -hmm. rather um, connected completely. And obviously indigenous ways of knowledge and knowing mm -hmm. um, don't, don't have these separations mm -hmm. of relationship and they're talking right. about all our relations. And so I think we'll, we'll be able to hopefully um, think in new ways as well um, by hearing from some of those leading uh, well leaders who've been a part of the founding of the International Indian Treaty Council, which was the very first uh, uh, non-governmental status organization um, at the United Nations, but that was is going to be having its uh, 50th anniversary coming up here because it was founded with the first um, uh, leaders came to, in 1974 to Standing Rock um, to try and really discuss what had happened at Wounded Knee um, and the, the really the, the devastation of at least two Wounded Knees on Pine Ridge. Anyhow, I think that we'll be learning a lot more around how do we continue to reconcile 
if that's a, a word, or heal, or reclaim, or try and acknowledge pass um, as we're trying to move forward. Um, and I think Maddie kind of linking to this other linkages is you're going to be working with us um, on the children's rights and youth activism that I know you've been really working on um, very much around children's rights. And I think we might even think about, you know, one of those briefings around service learning and human rights education or field experiences, you know, how, mm -hmm. how all fields continue to evolve. So that might be another uh, uh, yeah. topic guide that we could be thinking about for the future as well. And then I think we will, the, our last session, just to mention it here, is on ending a gun violence, um, but also looking at legislative um, actions and through uh, Amnesty International has been working and, and really at the front end of trying to look at how we can um, think about how we can not have violence in our communities and how do we also uh, uh, think about the policy angles on a number of our, our kind of uh, work and human rights violations that may occur um, within both racial and race lenses, um, discrimination lenses, uh, gender lenses um, in that process as well. Um, so Maddie, we, um, not to put you too much on the spot, but part of the idea behind this session was also to create space for folks to ask questions, um, both about human rights education, but also more generally about human rights. Um, and so I don't know if there are any burning questions you have or questions you think maybe others who are new to this work might have um, for us to address or any just thoughts in general about what we've kind of talked about already tonight. Yeah, I think, I mean, this has helped me a lot. So thank you so much. I think it's always interesting, you know, sort of what kinds of learners we are when we come together, whether we need the big picture first or the details. And I kind of need the big picture. So thank you for checking that box for me. And um, it just reminds me of a sort of similar orientation I had to peace studies when I kept thinking like, how did I miss the, you know, like in a certain sense and someone finally put my mind at rest saying, you know, peace studies kind of comes after the advent of computers in many ways, right? When you could aggregate data in a different way. And so um, you guys of course have been around longer than that, but I remember feeling like, how did I miss peace studies and social justice as a major, you know? And in fact, I think I was a little too, I'm a little too old for it, but so, so this really helps. And I think the one question I have for you all, just because, um, I wonder about this, you know, as I'm getting a little more steeped in the frameworks, is do you all feel that in the US we do less instruction overall on human rights? I mean, I know child rights is challenged for its own set of reasons, but but it feels to me like again, I I in my education I've gotten the once over lightly on human rights and I just wonder if there's kind of a reason <laughs> as you all see it yeah. like what <laughs> we need another hour <laughs> okay okay that can be another topic too well no, no i don't mean to cut that off i think that's a very important question i think i mean well there is a i i've heard nancy flowers speak about this a lot about the fact that i mean in fact what even got us going at the world as it could be and doing our project around the universal declaration was that we learned only 7% of the US population knew it existed. And yet it's supposed to be taught in high school. That is a, it's in our curriculum in California. And, and uh, I think there's a lot of political, uh, there's a, there are a lot of politics behind it because of the contention of having the UDHR adopted. You know, there's a great book called Eyes Off the Prize by Carol Anderson that, okay. goes, that goes into that. Thank you. Um, I learned this myself. Um, so yeah, we're lack, you know, there are a lot of people when you say you're doing something in human rights, will balk and say, what do you mean? Because it in, conjures up this idea that you're looking at violations or you're looking to be judgmental and critical. And uh, this is part of, I think, just a narrative that has been falsely um, spread about human rights and human rights education for 
since since I think the whole discussion about adopting the UDHR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I mean there as Sandy said, I think there are a lot of reasons, some of which align just their general hostility in the United States to human rights, let alone human rights yeah. education, um, and the fact that we haven't signed so many of the main human rights treaties, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then, yeah, on a state level, the the state politics. Yeah, yeah, probably all the all the things we all have as a group taught you know, are under extra scrutiny. And I just, but it, it sort of flabbergasts me because I, I think in, in part because my husband is Finnish and, and often it comes up in conversations, you know, sort of how human rights is taught K-12 and even at the college level, university level there. And, and I think about um, a colleague of Christie's and mine here in Minneapolis who who ran a Save the Children regional office in Norway. And, you know, they did a lot, of course, on child rights instruction there. So it just, it, it strikes me that, like, thank heavens HRE USA exists. And wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to in a way, right? The strongly optimistic. I mean, I see um, for a number of years, for 13 years, I was um, running human rights education programs at Columbia. And even over those years, the number anecdotally, the number of students who had had the opportunity to study human rights in high school or even major in it um, and college who were then applying to our graduate program, um, I noticed a difference in the number of students yeah. who had those opportunities. So yeah. hope maybe HRUSA can claim some success in those for some of those, but um, yeah. I'd like to think that we're, we're making progress. Yeah, I, I certainly think step back. Yep, yep. No, I certainly think you are. And I think, you know, it's just interesting to me to think about, <clears throat> excuse me, what, you know, what prompts a discipline like this. And so often it's the absence, you know, of some of the uh, seminal documents kind of, you know, being wholly agreed upon or whatever. And I think, and I, and I think about how things get, con you know, and to some degree, I guess there's reason for it to get conflated with civil rights as well. You know, and I think a lot of people in this country just assume it's all one. Right. Well, and I, I would say that I'm struck by this, this point in time where we are right now, because 30 years ago, actually this month, um, it was uh, the 500th anniversary of uh, Indigenous peoples discovering Columbus, and we were celebrating the quincentennial. And um, we did a mock trial of Christopher Columbus. And I um oh, God bless you. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I was going to sneeze. Um yeah. and um so we did the mock trial of Christopher Columbus that was held at the state capitol here in Minnesota. And during that time, I, I went back because I kept all my notes and you know, the pushback in the press. I mean, it was all around critical race theory and oh no. And and I'm struck by when we feel we, whoever the we is, but let's say um, this um, Eurocentric uh, model of what we, many of us were taught growing up. Um, in schools, that that was really what we learned. And when that's being challenged, that you're trying to say, well, wait, maybe Columbus didn't discover America. Yes, there were people here. The Tano people, you know, were, were here uh, welcoming Columbus or were here and what happened? And why do we know more about Columbus than the Tano people? or the indigenous, which who are the indigenous peoples um, that whom we first contacted. And, and so I think it, we're kind of in that same conflictual time right now. And we're recognizing, you know, are we a democracy? How are we holding together with recognizing our narrative? Okay, it's not all beautiful. You know, there, we're, there are conflicts, there are dissonance that we have to reconcile, rape, um, you know, violence, slavery, um, genocides. And so I think that tension is what we are grappling with, whether um, 
you have, I know Rosemary was talking about, how, you know, McCarthyism, you know, and what happened and you start realizing the interconnections global even, uh, you know, that were happening at the same time over, you know, in the Philippines, you know, that, you know, with, um, and so I, I think it, we're constantly trying to, to reconcile that. So I do think um, it, 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 there's a need for this and that it's a part of the relationship of, to our story, our collective story. Um, and how can we tell that without um, completely uh, creating more, I guess, violence and discrimination. And so how do you hold up people in our wholeness that we do have, um, we're not perfect. <laughs> And we obviously have been destruct, you know, destroying a lot of the land that we've been on and the waters. So we've got to figure out um, how to coalesce. Well, with that, I will thank everyone very much. Um, and Maddie, thank you for letting us put you on the spot. Um, to ask if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, thanks to Christy and Sandy. And we look forward to Thank for anybody you, who's watching this recorded. We hope to see you next time. <laughs> That'll be great. Thank you all. Thanks for getting me grounded. Great. Thanks. <laughs>